Have you ever wondered why sometimes planetary aspects coincide with significant changes in the price of a security, whereas other times the planetary aspects don't seem to work? So one possible cause of this is differences in declinations. Let's talk about how that could be leading to some planetary aspects working great sometimes, but not others. In the center of our solar system, we have the sun. And around the sun, we have the Earth, and we have some other planets such as Jupiter and Saturn. And these planets go in a circle around the sun. But they're not just doing a circle around the sun. They're also simultaneously, in addition to going around the sun, they're also simultaneously going up and they're going down with respect to their declination. So let's talk about how differences in declinations of planets could impact the effectiveness of a planetary aspect. Okay, so right here is a basic drawing of the planet Earth. So this will be North America and South America, as well as the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So right down the middle of the Earth is the equator. And if you have a planet such as Saturn or a planet such as Jupiter, and they are exactly in line with the Earth's equator, that's a situation where they would have a zero declination. So both of these two planets would have a declination of zero degrees. And this type of planetary aspect could be more powerful because in addition to the planets being aligned from Earth's perspective and having a longitude that's the exact same, they would also have a declination that's the exact same. So this type of planetary aspect could be more powerful. However, in contrast, sometimes Saturn is way up here and sometimes Jupiter is way down here. So if you have a situation like that, where the planets have such a large difference between them, where one planet is up very high and one planet is down very low, that type of situation could have a planetary aspect that's less powerful. So let's take a look at what happens if we give a greater weight to planetary aspects with a much lower difference, such as a declination of zero degrees between each other or a declination that's a lot closer versus planets that have a much greater declination difference. So we're going to specifically look at the historical effectiveness of opposition aspects between Jupiter and Saturn for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. This graph right here shows us a blue line, which is the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and it also shows us a red line. And this red line basically talks to us about how exact is the opposition aspect between Jupiter and Saturn. So as this red line gets higher and higher, the aspect between Jupiter and Saturn becomes more exact and as it goes down, it becomes less exact. And the reason why you see several of these lines is due to the fact that planets can have both retrograde as well as direct motion, and as a result, sometimes an aspect becomes more exact, less exact, more exact, less exact, a few times before the aspect goes away. So what we're going to look at here is we're going to find out for these types of situations where you have a planetary aspect between two planets, in this example, it's an opposition between Jupiter and Saturn, when it seems to be very helpful to take into account differences in declination versus when it does not really make much of a difference. And we'll go into some details of the analysis in a second, but first I'll give you the conclusion. And the conclusion is that for a situation like this where you have a planetary aspect become more exact, less exact, approximately five times, the first one and the last one seem to work pretty well regardless of differences in declination. However, the ones in the middle those do seem to give you a good indication of which ones will work and which ones won't work based upon differences in declination. So long story short, if you take into account differences in declination, for these in the middle here, it gives you a much better sense for which ones you might want to ignore versus which ones you might want to take into account. Okay, so the first aspect we're going to look at is an opposition between Jupiter and Saturn that took place around 2011. And what you're going to see in this situation is a graph on the left and a graph on the right. The graph on the left does not take into account differences in declination. The graph on the right, it does take into account differences in declination. So if you notice, the graph on the right, it only has one line up and down. And that's because of these five items on the left, only the, only the first one took place during a time where there was a very close declination between Jupiter and Saturn. Whereas the rest of the four had a situation where there was a relatively large difference between the declination of Jupiter and Saturn. And as a result, this first one was showing up on the right, whereas it's not showing up on the left, simply because on the right side, we're giving a greater weight to aspects where the declination is pretty small between the two planets. So uh, if you recall that methodology that we talked about a second ago from the conclusion, 
it's that from the conclusion it's that the first item and the last item seem to work well whereas the middle ones for those it's worth taking into account differences in declination so if we use that methodology this first item here and the last item here they both corresponded to terms that were relatively significant for the Dow Jones whereas these ones in the middle right here if you notice on the right they're not showing up they weren't very useful so Right now what we're doing is we're basically saying that, okay, because the difference in declination was so great, we're pretty much going to ignore the ones that are in the middle. So I would say out of this one, from a scale of 10 out of 10, I would say that using the methodology that we talked about, uh, this seemed to be pretty helpful, taking into account differences in declination because we would know to pretty much ignore those ones in the middle. Let's go to the next example. So the next time that there was an opposition between Jupiter and Saturn, it was in 1931. And if you look here, you'll see that on the right side, where you take into account differences in declination, you'll see that there were zero instances where anything showed up. And that's because all of these times, the declination between Jupiter and Saturn was relatively large. If we think back to that methodology that we talked about, we want to take into account the first and the last one, regardless of what it says on the right. So here you can see the first one corresponded with a relatively significant high and a significant turn in the Dow Jones. And this one over here on the right, this corresponded to a low in the Dow Jones, whereas the ones in the middle weren't really worth taking into account. And that's what you're seeing over here. And just to recap the methodology, it's to take into account the first one and the last one, but to ignore the middle ones if they don't show up over here on the right for the graph that takes into account differences in declination. So for this one, I would say that it was pretty helpful to be able to have a sense for which declinations to take into account versus which ones to ignore. The next time there was an opposition between Jupiter and Saturn was in 1951. And if you see here, there are five times where the aspect became more or less exact. Right here is number one, and then number two, number three, number four, and then number five right here. This one's a little bit smaller, but if you look closely, you can still see it. So if we keep to that same methodology, it's looking at that first one and looking at the last one, but then ignoring the ones in the middle. And if you do that, let's see what it would look like over here on the right. So either way, we would take into account this first item right here. So that did correspond to a significant turn, so that was useful. This last item right here, that also corresponded to a top, so that was pretty useful. And then if you look at the ones in the middle, of these three, the one that probably is the biggest turn is the one in the middle. So this right here seems to be the best turn of, among the three. And if you look over here on the right, when you take into account differences of declinations, it does show that among these three items, the one that's the highest the one that's the most significant is this date right here, which you could say is the, the date that is corresponding to the date with the largest change in the Dow Jones. So even though these two items um, aren't as significant of highs, it's nice that it did on the right give us lower values for these. Uh, so that was helpful. It was helpful to be able to see that among these three, this one was the most important one, and then this was less important, and this one was the least. So that was helpful. Uh, but I would give this a score of 7 out of 10, because I like the uh, the previous ones that we looked at a little bit better. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So for this one here, there's also five. Once again, we have a small one. So this is the first one. It's relatively small, but if you look for it, you can see it. So it's one, two, three, four, and five. So if we take into account the first and the last one, so that's saying, let's take this into account, that corresponded to a top. And if we take into account the last one, this one also corresponded to a top. So the top took place right around here, and that's when this last one took place. So looking at the first one and the last one, that seemed to be pretty powerful. If you go over here to the right, you'll see that nothing else showed up. So none of the middle ones uh, showed up. So what, did the, what does that tell us? Uh, not only did the ones in the middle not show up, here's what's very interesting. Uh, this first item, even though it's extremely small right here, even though the aspect is not all that exact, the difference in declination was extremely tight between Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter and Saturn, uh, even though the aspect wasn't very exact from a longitude perspective, from a declination perspective, the, the aspect was very exact. Uh, so if you come over here, you can see that that really popped, that really jumped out. So if you take into account 3D declinations, what this shows you is that this item right here, among all of these, this one was the most significant. And then sure enough, if you look at it, that was a pretty significant high. So without looking at 3D declinations, without being able to take into account differences in declinations, this item over here on the left is what we would be left with, and that's not quite as helpful. Whereas over on the right, when you do take into account differences in declinations, this is amazing, and it pretty much tells us exactly what the top was.
So I would say that for this one, uh, I would give it a 10 out of 10 score as far as how helpful it was to be able to identify differences in declinations. Okay, so on to this one. So of all the ones we're going to cover today, this one is the least helpful. So the next time that there was an opposition between Jupiter and Saturn, it took place in 1990. And over here on the left, you'll see that there were one, two, three items. And what's interesting about this is all of the previous ones that we looked at, there were five. It was one, two, three, four, five. Whereas this one, it's, it's kind of weird, it's kind of different because this one had only one, two, three. So maybe if there's only three, um, maybe the process isn't quite the same. Maybe it doesn't work the, the same way that, as it usually would. So if you take into account the differences in declinations, you'll see nothing over here on the right. So this basically means that for all three of these situations, there was a relatively large difference in declination between Jupiter and Saturn. So if you do take into account differences in declination, you'll see nothing show up here on the right, which basically means that for all three of these, there was a relatively large difference in declination between Jupiter and Saturn. So worst case scenario, you just wouldn't really take that aspect into account. So I would say in the whole scheme of things, it's not really that big of a deal that nothing showed up. Uh, you could say that this one in the middle did correspond to a change in trend, but I would say that it's probably better to uh, skip over a planetary aspect that's working than to rely on a planetary aspect that doesn't work. So in the whole scheme of things, even though this wasn't the most effective one, and I was pretty conservative, I gave it a ranking of zero out of 10. Ultimately, uh, on the right here, it wasn't really telling us to expect a turn and a turn didn't happen. That would actually be worse. What this did was it simply told us, um, hey, there's nothing really worth taking into account and we possibly would have missed one situation where we could have identified a top. The last aspect we're going to talk about today is the opposition between Jupiter and Saturn that took place in 2011. So you'll see here, there were three items that showed up if you don't take into account differences in declinations. And of these three, the worst one is probably this one right here. So this one took place when the Dow Jones was simply increasing and it wasn't really a change in trend. It really wasn't any significant point right here. So that one's really not that relevant. And if you come over here on the right, you'll see that nothing shows up. So uh, the differences in declination, that was able to tell us that this is something that wasn't really worth taking into account. Uh, this one right here in the middle, it was some, somewhat useful because you can see that there's a top right here. So it was somewhat useful in that it took place at about the same time as this top that you see right here. So that was a relatively significant top. So that was somewhat helpful. And you can see over here on the right that when you do take into account differences in declination, it does give you a slight value right here. And then finally, this right here took place during a low in the Dow Jones. And you can see that it's a relatively long time period and pretty much in the exact middle here, that's where you can see that there was a turn. And on the right, uh, this is basically pointing out saying that yes, this one right here is a turn. So in the middle of this thing right here, uh, that is a time where we could be at a turning point for the Dow Jones. So for this one, I gave it a score of 10 out of 10. So to summarize, we had one instance where taking into account 3D declinations really didn't help us all that much. Um, once again, just to recap, that was a situation where it didn't give us any signals. So worst case scenario, it wasn't that it gave us a bad signal. It was more than it just said, hey, nothing right here is really worth taking into account. Uh, so that was the one that got the worst score. We had one instance where we got a 10 out of 10 and four instances where there was a 10 out of 10. So I would say that it does seem to be helpful to take into account differences in the declination of planets when we're trying to determine how powerful planetary aspects are. And in case you haven't seen it before, the Create Your Own Siderograph tool, it has a little drop-down box right here where all you have to do is simply change this value in the drop-down box from no to yes. And once you do that, that will actually take into account differences in declinations for you. So you can basically see what is the impact on planetary aspects when you do and when you don't take into account declinations.